About 10 years ago when I was 14 and had just started to realize I was a lesbian, a beautiful girl that I barely knew had asked me out. I was just thrilled to be noticed and have someone want me. So I ignored the fact that I didn't really know her that well and that she kind of gave off a cold, distant, creepy vibe that was in direct conflict with my own spunky and warm attitude. I figured there was no way she would ever hurt me, especially since she was a woman and I had never heard of a woman abusing another woman. I know, I was ridiculously naive, and I know that now. A few weeks into the relationship, she started beating me when she didn't get what she wanted, even sometimes doing so right in front of people. No one did anything to stop it. They just politely looked away. She started demanding I have sex with her, even physically forcing me to do so and threatening to kill me if I didn't comply. It took a few months, but my fear of her was finally overridden by a desire to not be the girlfriend of some psychopath, and I dumped her and told my mother, her parents, the police, and everyone who had been around us what she had done. My ex swore she would kill me. Those were the last words she said to me. My parents believed me. Her parents believed me. The police believed me. But I wound up not pressing any charges after realizing how unlikely it was that she would serve any time. However, she got all of our friends. They all sided with her, and I wound up having to change schools over this. Soon after we moved to a different city, I got the help I needed and I felt like a changed person. I moved back to the same city where I met my ex when I started college. It's a huge state university with more than 50,000 students, but I figured I'd probably never see her, and knowing her that it was very unlikely she even went there. She was an actress and a singer, and I figured that she probably had gone to a school known for those kind of things. My college was known for science and infamous for having a very underfunded art program. Well, on the very first day though, I saw her. I felt a cold stare on the back of my neck and turned around, and there she was, 100 feet away from me staring me down with a blank expression on her face. I glared at her and sneered trying to show her that I wasn't afraid of her, and she just kept the same cold expression. I turned and walked away at a relaxed pace and tried not to let it ruin my day. But then it started. Everywhere I went, she was a hundred feet away. Sometimes she was with some of her friends and they would all just stare at me with the same blank expression. I never engaged them. I never spoke to any of them. Eventually, they had even started following me when I wasn't on campus. It's gotten to the point where I can't even enjoy a day at the mall, a day with my girlfriend, a trip to the zoo, or even buy groceries without a dead-eyed girl who beat the crap out of me when I was 14, along with her weird crew staring at me. They literally look like freaky-looking zombies. It's creepy. I even catch other people giving them freaked-out looks when they see them. It's been about six years since she started following me around. I've thought about moving or changing schools but I know that I can't let her run my life anymore. It's starting to get creepier and creepier though. Sometimes someone knocks loudly on my door and when I go to answer it, there's no one there, but I have this sinking feeling that it's her. Sometimes random numbers in my area code leave messages of silence for about 30 seconds on my phone or I get sent text messages from random numbers asking, who is this? I never respond to the texts or voicemails and immediately just block the numbers of the senders. I don't know what to do. I know I'm not cracking up. If I'm ever out with other people when I think I see her, I ask if they do too, and they always say yes. I want to call the cops. I want to fight back. I want to do something to prove that I'm not some pushover. But really, I just wanted to put this all behind me. That's all I've ever wanted. Update. Just a few things that I forgot to mention before I actually end this story. I'm in a graduate school now. I graduated college in four years. I go to a different university now in an online IT program. I only still live in the same city because my family's here. I've taken self-defense classes and I carry pepper spray around with me also. Changing where I shopped helped and I haven't seen her in a while, but the messages still happen sometimes. If I ever see her again, I'm going to get a restraining order against her at the very least. One more update. 
I haven't seen this girl since I posted this, and I heard from someone else that she moved to New York City recently. I have no idea if this is true, but it feels nice not to have to stay in my house for weeks. I developed agoraphobia because of this, and I never leave my house if I don't have to. I even make people call or text me if they feel like coming over and tell me when they're close by. Luckily, my neighbors seem aware of my situation somehow, and they look out for me too. In addition, I think it's worth noting that recently my girlfriend and I had a jar of pee thrown at us when we were exiting a store. No joke. The car drove away so quickly that we weren't able to catch the license plate. I'm not sure if it's related or not, but it could have been someone who knows her. It was a white guy in a red and black van. That's all we know. So when I was 17, I didn't really hang out with very great kids, I'll admit. I never got into many bad situations and I turned out pretty well in the end, I think. But this one relationship I had was definitely a creepy one. My friend Corey and I decided that one day we would go to his friend Jay's house. Let me just say that Jay's house was actually a crappy lonesome quadplex off the side of a highway. The inside of it was disgusting and every wall had at least two or three punch holes in them. Doors were off hinges and propped up against door frames. What little furniture they had was obviously very used. I'm not much of a judger. This doesn't bother me, really. We eventually smoke and then leave. We went back to Jay's the next day. Jay's now showing obvious interest in me, and in a moment alone in the kitchen, he had asked me to be his girlfriend. I'm an idiot, so I say yes. After about two days of knowing this guy, I say yes. We stay a while, a group of people leave to go get food, and Jay and I are alone. He starts showing obvious signs that he wants to have sex, and though it's a bit fast for me, I reluctantly go along. I'm his girlfriend, right? He's got a pot belly. I never notice this because he hides it. Now, this isn't bad by any means, but everybody has a type and I personally prefer very skinny, lanky guys. He hid this with oversized clothing and a thick scruff. I'm a nice person though, and I don't let this bother me. Surely he has other nice qualities, right? Wrong. He's the one that punches all the holes in the wall. He doesn't go to school, spends all of his money on weed and food, as does his mom, and a month later he's homeless. His druggy mom literally just abandoned him and his brother and goes off on her own. I know I've made a mistake, but I'm a cowardly and helpful woman. My parents agree that he can sleep in the basement, but no sex. Perfectly fine by me. But every night for two weeks he would appear at my door to come to his bed while I would whisper things about my mom and dad hearing until he would finally give up. We've been dating for like a month and a half at this point. He moves to his ex-stepdad's 40 minutes away. Every time I visit, his stepdad makes lewd comments about me and about me and Jay having sex. There's a six and an eight year old there. They like to brag to me about how much weed they could smoke. I know that I probably should have called CPS, but forgive me. Like I said, I was a real idiot at the time. I still kind of am. On my last visit to Jay's new home, we went to Subway to eat. His stepdad asks me what I want, and I just say I'm not hungry. He then says out loud right in front of the subway guy and the whole rest of the family, Yeah, she's probably too full from all that dick she's been eating. Both the subway guy and I just shared a look, an uncomfortable look. I break up with Jay through texts, and I'm immediately flooded with texts. They range from, Baby, I love you. Please don't do this. To, I swear I'm gonna kill you. He sends me pictures of bongs that he bought for me, with money that he gets from selling stolen items, and when I don't respond to the gifts, he starts threatening to kill me again. I stopped responding to them because of my dad's advice. He's now filled in on the situation, and he just says to ignore it. I'm literally receiving 300 plus texts a day and around 100 phone calls. This eventually stops after about a week because he starts texting my dad multiple times. My dad flips out on him and suddenly the stepdad's involved. The stepdad is claiming that I owe money for food and gas and stuff. 
My dad basically tells him to just eat shit. Texts and phone calls continue for around three months afterwards. Not in such large amounts, but maybe like one or two a day. He still tries to add me on Facebook to this day about every four months, and it's been like four years. That relationship was only three months long. I don't know why he was so obsessed with me. When I was 13 and starting 8th grade, I met a guy who I'll call X. We had 4 out of 6 classes together and similar interests, so we became really close friends even though he never seemed to give off any vibe and he was sort of antisocial. X was a tall, scrawny Mexican-American kid with acne scars who wore a lot of alt and edgy clothing, the type that you would buy at Hot Topic or Spencer's. One of his main outfits was a black trench coat with ripped black jeans, a gray graphic tee, and combat boots. Remember this because it'll come into play a little later. We live on the outskirts of a military base in a rural area that was just being developed. There were three types of kids in middle slash high school. The normal suburban kids, the military kids, and the lesser off kids who lived in the old trailer parks and mobile homes. Now, I was a normal suburban kid, and X was a military kid. X and I were really close, but we weren't dating. Halfway through the year when X and I had both turned 14, I had actually started dating a guy who I'll call Y who played football. Soon after we started dating, a few rumors about him appeared, and an Instagram page dedicated to school drama posted screenshots of him saying slurs and other horrible stuff. Y claimed that the screenshots were totally fake and that he would never say that stuff, but X manipulated me into breaking up with him. Later on, I learned he got pressured by school officials to leave the football team. This cycle repeated with other guys and girls that I dated. For context, I'm bisexual. Even if I hadn't dated them and just had a crush on them, they would turn out to be horrible people and would be shunned by the rest of the school. It still angers me today how stupid I was to not realize that the only person who I told my crushes to was X. I was in a really dark spot, and while looking back, I know it might sound pathetic to be so emotional about middle school relationships, but you have to understand that to a 14-year-old me, this was basically life or death. Halfway through the last semester, I hadn't officially started dating X just yet, but considering how close I was with him, we were effectively dating. At the time, with all of my failed relationships through X's manipulation and low self-confidence, I basically had put the fault onto me. So when my relationship with X went well, I was extremely happy and had lots of trust with him. I now realize that X had tore up my self-confidence and then manipulated me into trusting him. All he had ever done to show affection was just small gifts and favors, such as when he drew one of my favorite characters from a TV show I loved or how he would let me have a school lunch. Keep in mind, school lunch was free at the time, and he had already brought his own lunch from home, which basically meant that he had my love, trust, and care all for very little effort. He had almost full control of me all for the price of having to go in the lunch line and sketching some TV show characters for me. It makes me so damn mad how blindly I trusted him. Thankfully, I never did anything sexual with him. But he had so much influence and I trusted him so much that I would often change in front of him and he convinced me to lie to my parents so I could sleep over at his place, which was almost always empty due to divorce and military deployments. I remember one incident where I was at his house and he offered me a beer. My mother was an alcoholic, so I had been strictly raised not to drink alcohol, so I put my foot down and refused. He looked at me blankly for a brief second before then saying, Bummer. Well, if you won't have one, then I won't either. After this, I started to see more red flags, such as how he would laugh at offensive jokes that he normally wouldn't find funny in front of me, or how a lot of the candy, gum, and small gifts he would give me looked to be shoplifted. Instead of waking up to the reality that he was a horrible and manipulative person, I simply wrote them off as small cons that were outweighed by the pros. I can't explain how mad I am at myself for not distancing myself from him, and instead of that, I stupidly stayed with him. By the time the final exams were coming up and school was ending, he actually started distancing himself from me. It was small things at first, like standing in different places in the lunch line or just hanging out less, 
but since he had so much control over me. When X started to drift away, I had no clue how to do anything to help myself. By the time I realized I would go days without him even making eye contact with me, this affected me so much that I nearly failed my final exams. You might think that this sounds stupid, but X manipulated me so much to the point that my world revolved all around him so much that when he stopped talking to me, I couldn't even look at myself because I had automatically placed the blame on myself. Eventually, before school ended, I had found myself a girlfriend who I'll call Z. Z was another military kid who had transferred schools halfway through the year. Keep in mind, I was pretty short and slightly out of shape. Z was taller, really skinny, so this kind of ruined my self-confidence. From my few interactions with her, she seemed really fatigued and borderline antisocial. Although with X, they would talk to each other a mile a minute, gossiping about other people and making horrible and offensive jokes. I was so depressed at this point that I didn't even bother to show up for the last few days of school, and I spent so much of my summer in my room feeling both angry and sad at the same time. He had manipulated me so much that I didn't know who to be angry at. Thankfully, due to my amazing older brother and some friends of mine who didn't like X or Z, I was able to regain my confidence and get my mental health in a way better place. From what I heard over the summer about X and Z, Z actually had a drug problem and took pills often. This was made worse when X started selling vapes to middle schoolers to fund to buy more drugs. Even worse for her, through her sheer stupidity, X managed to piss off some shady online hacker guys who leaked Z's nudes. Z's parents apparently had no idea of any of this but they had moved shortly after the summer ended due to Z's nearly overdosing. Luckily, in freshman year, I had zero classes with him, but due to the school being relatively small, I would still see X from time to time in the hallways. The only creepy encounter that I had with X in high school was when he was in with some mutual friends who still somehow liked him, and X waved to me creepily while smiling and laughing. Around halfway through the school year, when we were both about 15 at this point, I actually heard X was moving away. A lot of my mutual friends were actually somehow sad, and they even threw a mini party for X during lunch on his last day. I was also in a good mood that day since I would never have to see him again. This is the part of the story that still gives me chills to this day. After school ended and our mutual friends all said goodbye to X and I was at home doing some studying for a test I had. My parents were out for dinner and it was just me and my older brother and his friend. I was upstairs in my room studying with my window that faces the backyard opened up for some fresh air, while my older brother who was 16 was downstairs in the living room with his friend playing video games. We live in the corner of the suburb and had no backyard fence, so our yard just ended into a kudzu filled forest. As I was studying, it got really windy, so I decided to close the window. As I was closing it though, I saw a figure in our backyard. My stomach dropped and I tried not to scream as I walked downstairs and told my brother and his friend what I just saw. They both got up and my brother then told me, Alex, go to your room and lock the door, before they then went outside. The following is what my brother told me when I asked what happened later on, since I started to cry when I got into my room and I was way too scared to look outside. My brother and his friend both ran outside as fast as possible and the figure froze for a brief second. With a clearer view, they could then see what he was wearing. A black trench coat and combat boots. My brother didn't recognize him as X since they had never actually met, but they were so determined to catch the possible intruder. They chased him through the forest into a field where they were forced to give up because they were wearing sandals and the land was so tilled they could sprain an ankle. When my brother and his friend returned home, I had stopped crying but I was so scared I was hiding in my closet. They eventually calmed me down enough to explain to me what had happened, and although they wanted to call the cops, I had begged them not to since I was really afraid of the consequences. It's been several years since that all happened, and I'm starting my freshman year of college. I still wonder what he was planning to do or if he was just watching me. To X, who made my life hell, manipulated me, and abused me. I hope you burn in hell, you sick bastard. I now have a loving girlfriend and I got into a really great college. So please, if anyone is in a toxic relationship out there, do not be afraid to stand up for yourself. 
And please don't let yourself be defined just as a victim for the rest of your life. You deserve better than that. I've always liked that I had a special magnet that attracted weird people and situations. So here's yet another story. To this day, I haven't fully figured it out. My husband dated a girl named Emily in high school for a few years. Upon graduation, she decided to go to college out of state and they eventually broke up. Nothing dramatic, just parted ways. He and I met a few years later and we ended up getting married, obviously. I knew of Emily through friends as we live in a very small town and everyone thought she was really wonderful, but I had never met her, face to face or anything. About six months after we were married, I got a phone call on my cell phone in the middle of the night, and when I answered, it was a woman crying hysterically and ranting about how I ruined her future. How she and my husband were supposed to get married in October, and he didn't really love me, etc. I then said, Um, who is this? And she then screamed that it was Emily, then hung up. I woke my husband up, and we were both completely puzzled as he hadn't talked to her in years at this point. Over the next couple of months, both of us would get random phone calls at random times of this crying woman accusing us of ruining her life. We eventually stopped answering any calls except from known numbers. Around this time, my husband ran into Emily's brother, Jason, who was married and lived fairly close to us. They struck up a friendship and we would often go to barbecues, etc. We were friendly acquaintances versus close friends so we never really brought up the calls from Emily. Jason would occasionally mention things about her graduating from college, starting a physician's assistant program, and getting married, but not going into too much detail. I think he was just respecting our marriage, etc. Every time he mentioned her, my skin would crawl. Then Facebook became popular and I started getting messages from Emily. Her full maiden name, a profile picture of her grinning and squinting into the sun, the messages were basically what she was saying on the phone. My husband hated me and I ruined her life and stole her family, etc. When I clicked on the profile, it would have no friends, no posts, just that one picture. So I blocked her. Then she made another one, sent messages, same picture, and same type of profile. I must have blocked about 20 accounts. It was so frequent that I wouldn't even mention it to my husband. After a while, it was just a given. Her harassment by no means was a focal point in our life, but it was always there. Fast forward a few years, the Facebook messages coming in more infrequent. We've now had a child and are expecting another one, and Jason mentions yay. Emily is moving back with her family. She has a husband and kid, and she's accepted a PA position in our town's major pediatric clinic. Our mutual friends were excited and were going to switch to her for their health care, but I refused. She'd probably murder my kids. I heard she was back. Mutual friends mentioned seeing her and that she's doing really great. Blah, blah, blah. Then we were at another mutual friend's daughter's birthday party, and they casually mentioned that Emily would be coming by. Literally everyone knew that my husband and her had dated in high school, so I felt I couldn't get away from her and hearing about her. The success story from our tiny town, Gag. I was such a bundle of anxiety waiting for Emily to show up. My heart was pounding. I was shaky. I felt like I needed to vomit and then diarrhea. It was terrible. Then walks in this completely normal everyday woman. She walked in with her husband who also looked normal, as well as their daughter. She greeted my husband and I very casually said it was nice to meet me and continued to circulate. What the hell? This is the person who's been terrorizing us? It did not add up. The messages on Facebook continued for another six months or so. Then they stopped. To this day, I cannot match the person on the phone and Facebook to that woman at the birthday party being the same person. I'm completely baffled. My father had been dating this woman for a while, and things were going great. She met us a few times and got along really great with my sister and I. Eventually, my father had asked her to move in with us. 
She drove seven hours to move in and brought her two cats. Things were going really great for the first two months, until she couldn't find a job. They had agreed that she was to apply for jobs and have one secured for an interview before she moved in. She moved in on July 2nd. She didn't have a job until late January. I, being fresh out of high school with no experience in a job setting, was able to get a job before her. This caused my father to have to cover her car payments and insurance. This set us back financially, but we were okay. Then October came with the discovery of a full year's worth of text messages between her and a friend of hers named Jared all taking place after my father and her were dating, all while she was still living in her hometown. These text messages were laced with him coming over and giving her nighttime lovings, and inappropriate pictures as well. My father confronted her about it and she totally denied it, saying we just didn't understand her friendships. My father lets it go as they hadn't messaged each other in weeks. Small arguments pop up and she starts sneaking money out of my dad's wallet at night to go buy cigarettes. This may only sound like a small amount, but it was a nightly occurrence. This set us back financially as well. These arguments mainly consist of her lying about something and her not admitting it or her doing something stupid and not apologizing. Things got even worse as Christmas came. My father expressed that he didn't love her anymore. He didn't have any feelings towards her and that she needed to work to fix the relationship if she wanted to continue. This meant really trying to get a job and not lying about stupid crap. She agreed that she would. I advised him against giving her the option. I was really tired of her crap and I wanted her out. She started lying more and more, causing even more problems. We believed that she had started taking some sort of drug, as she would come back from a drive all shaky and spazzing out, spouting nonsense. She came after myself and a friend of mine during one of their arguments to which my father responded. Okay, that's it. Pack your shit and get the hell out. How dare you go after my kids? Telling her to get out and leave was a regular occurrence in their fights, but she never took the hint. She was abusive emotionally to literally everyone in the household, especially my father, reducing him to tears when he found out that she had been receiving $1,000 a month from her mother, which would have had us staying up to date on rent payments. We have no idea what she was doing with the money. No matter the situation, she would always try and twist it so that she would be the victim. Even calling my father asking second opinions. The party of persecuting Martha. Nothing is ever her fault and it's always a misunderstanding. Then she started smoking in the garage. The door from the garage into the house is right across from my bedroom door, which is always open because our cat's like sleeping on my bed with me. I have asthma. I woke up coughing and smelling cigarettes multiple times in one night because of her. She also drove recklessly with my little sister and I in the car before, and I told my father what happened. When my father confronted her about it, she said that I was over-exaggerating, that driving in the dark freaks her out, that my sister and I were just stressing her out, even though that we were just chilling and listening to music. A minor thing, but she endangered my sisters and my own cats. We have two strictly indoor cats, and her two outdoor cats too until they moved here. Her cats have taught mine how to sneak out of the house when the door isn't latched. She leaves the front door open constantly when she comes back in from smoking and lets my cats out. We live right across the street from a huge lot of desert, and we hear the coyotes every night. She's let them out at night before. After she finally got a job, she didn't want to contribute her fair share of the bills. My father asked her for half of her paychecks every two weeks. She claimed that it should only be 25% because there are four people in the house. My sister and I are only there on the weekends, as we go to school outside of town, which is about an hour away, and we stay with other family during that time. She also apparently wasn't paying her car payments after she got her job as she got a repossession notice, which she hid from my father. Finally, after financially wrecking us, abusing my father emotionally and financially, endangering myself and my sister, doing drugs, taking money, stealing things from my room, endangering my cats, and many other things, my father gave her two weeks to move out. 
She moved out a couple of days ago. She originally left her cats, but failed to pay my father the $350 that she owed him. So he said that he would be taking care of her cats until he got the money. She totally flipped out and burst into the house when I was there alone, saying horrible things about my father and that her babies weren't safe here. When I called her out for not paying the money and everything else mentioned above, she told me that I was sipping the damn Kool-Aid. I really wish I was joking about this. I finally shut the door to my bedroom and started sobbing because I just couldn't handle this. She actually came after me by banging on my bedroom door and saying how horrible I was and said that I just slammed my door in her face. I called my father on my phone on FaceTime and I opened my bedroom door and then she bolted into the garage. I followed her while my father screamed at her to give me her key to the house. She ran right past me screaming nonsense and then went back into the living room. I finally had enough and with my dad on the phone I let her have it. I was yelling and screaming and cursing at her. I was mad and there was nothing for me to lose at this point. Finally, I then told her to get the hell out of my house. She grabbed her cats by the scruff and then ran out of the house. I still worry for those cats every day. I love them dearly and they became such a huge part of our family. I hope nothing but the best comfy loving lives for them and the most painful existence for her. Update. It's actually been a few years now. Well, my dad's ex-girlfriend is now deceased. She died from a drug overdose. Go figure. I'm a 16-year-old girl, and this happened to me last year only a few weeks after I turned 15. For some background, my sister is three years older than me, and so this took place when she had only just turned 18. She had been dating her boyfriend on and off again for about two years. We'll name him Steven. Just so you know, my parents are divorced, so I lived with my mom, sister, and my older brother. We had our house renovated instead of moving out when the house got cramped. As for the layout, there's a very small bedroom that my brother has, a medium-sized bedroom my mom has, and then a large bedroom that me and my sister shared. Well, as we got older, we obviously wanted our own space. So my mom had a wall built between the large room to make two smaller rooms. The only problem was that you'd have to walk through one room to get to the other. At first, I had the room that would have to be walked through by my sister so she was able to get to her room. Okay, back to the story. So my sister's dating this guy who's the same age as our dad. And Steven also had a daughter the same age as my sister. This guy was a terrible influence on my sister. She stopped going to school, went to raves, and she was introduced to drugs thanks to her boyfriend. Her boyfriend was very well known in our small village, as only a few years back he had a huge drug raid at his old home. He also used to get into a lot of fights, big fights. He once almost killed a guy in just a fist fight. He was also well known to furiously beat on his girlfriends. So no surprise that neither of my parents approved of it. Well, this caused my sister to move out and go live with him, and as ridiculous as it sounds, it was out in a tent in a wooded area. You see, he was living there because he became homeless. So against my mom's better judgment, she actually invited him to live at our house just so she'd be able to know that my sister was safe. Now, I'm a very reserved and shy person, especially around people I don't know. He was no different. Obviously, he had to walk through my room to get to my sister's, and I had always assumed my uneasiness and uncomfortableness was due to not knowing it. Fast track a few weeks. By the time my sister turned 17, she found out she was pregnant. She was thrilled about it, but Stephen wasn't. My mom was so disappointed that my sister had gotten pregnant so young, but she was happy to support her. One day, my mom finds my sister distraught, and she tells my mom that Stephen wants her to abort the baby, and that he even forced her to take a pill which would start the process. As bad as it sounds, I didn't really zone in to whatever was going on. At the time, I didn't realize that I was slowly sinking into depression. Fast forward a few months, and my sister and the boyfriend decided to keep the baby, 
and she had a growing belly while my depression worsened. At one point, I decided to try and tell my mom how I felt. She ended up sobbing and blaming herself for it, which only made me feel absolutely awful. Safe to say, I didn't try and tell her again. As the months go by, things start getting a little weird. I'd walk up in the night and find Steven just sort of standing in my room. As soon as he was caught, he would either rush into my sister's room or out of mine to go downstairs. As uncomfortable as it made me, I didn't bother to bring it up to my mom. We weren't on the best of terms at this point, as I had stopped going to school regularly until I just wasn't going at all anymore. The majority of the time I would spend in our shower room. Other strange things were the inappropriate comments on what I'd wear. I'm a well-figured girl, even from a young age, so the comments were normal from boys at my school, but it was really weird coming from my sister's boyfriend, not to mention how much older he was. There was one particular item of clothing that he had a liking for, a silk nightgown that was a little above the knee and had a small plunge in the neckline. As you know, I'm a reserved person, so showing my body really makes me uncomfortable but I really liked this dress because of its softness. So I did wear it a lot, but that was before I noticed his strange attitude towards it. To start off, he simply said things like, Hey, I really like that dress. I chose to just ignore him, but then he started to say, I really like the way you look in that. I like when you wear that. I was just so creeped out and just stopped wearing it altogether as well as wearing anything revealing around him at all. I went unbothered by him for a while. Then my sister had the baby and me and her swapped rooms as mine was just slightly bigger than hers. My mom and I were constantly arguing. Well, more of her belittling me and just making me feel worse than I already did. So when my nephew was born on my birthday, I spent my birthday all alone the whole day simply just crying in my room. I absolutely hated living there and I wanted to be anywhere else. A few weeks pass and my mom's and my own anger reach a bowling point and we explode into an extremely awful shouting match. I still don't know why, but Steven decided to get involved and also began to disrespect me. At some point, my sister pulled my mom downstairs to try and calm her down and left me upstairs with Steven. He left my room and I assumed went downstairs as well. Wrong. He had actually decided to shut my sister's door, came back into my room, and then shut my door. This is where things totally hit the fan. Steven completely blows up in my face. This terrifying six foot something muscular man towered over my five foot four small frame as he shouted things that genuinely left me terrified. It gives me the chills just recalling it. He then screamed in my face. If you were my own daughter and behaving like this, I'd lock you in a room with nothing but a mattress, and I'd only give you one meal a day. He continued to go on and on about how disgusting and disrespectful I was. I was on the verge of a panic attack. I swear I blacked out for a few seconds out of fear, which caused me to fall into my bed. He was so angry that he was physically holding himself back to not throw a punch at me. I could see it in his face. He wanted to hit me so badly. He would pull his arm back as if to throw a punch, but then he would stop when his fist came close to my face. I thought that he was going to beat me black and blue like he was yelling in my face that he would. But the most disturbing part of the situation, the one thing he said that I won't ever be able to forget, was when he hissed quietly in my face that I deserved to be beaten and raped. And then after that he walked out and I sobbed against my bedroom door. Absolutely terrified he would come back and keep to that promise. The next morning was a school day, and Stephen decided that I needed to wake up at 6am and then came into my room, picked me up while I was asleep, and then dropped me. I woke up terrified and in pain. He then crouched down to be face to face with me, and he said if I didn't go to school then he'd do a lot worse than that to me. He then went back to my sister in her room, told her what he did and then they both laughed about it while I was crying in the next room. I went to school that day not even bothering to retrieve my lunch from my mom. Once I was at school, I went straight to my favorite teacher and proceeded to have a complete mental breakdown about everything I've been going through. I explained what had happened and how I was too afraid to go home. 
Social services were called along with my mom. My mom told me the minute she found out what happened, she demanded that Stephen take his stuff and get the hell out of our house. After that incident, I wasn't allowed to go out on my own because Stephen had been threatening to kill me and set our house on fire. He had even attacked my older brother who had to get stitches after having his eyebrows split open. Our house had to have a red alert on it, so if we called the police, they'd come straight away. After about a month or so, it went quiet, and we didn't hear from Stephen anymore, and I was so glad. But then I was informed that Stephen had been arrested. The reason? He had raped an old ex of his, one that lived in the same village as us, and he was being jailed for eight years minimum. It scares me to think that when he said that I deserved to be raped, that he wasn't just saying that to scare me. What a psychotic, disgusting man. This all started my sophomore year of high school. I was 15 and at a new school, so I didn't have many friends yet. I was in that phase where I thought I needed a boyfriend to have validation, so I was actively trying to find a date for the homecoming dance. One of my classmates suggested a junior in one of our classes whom I'll call David to be my date, and he got him to ask me out. He seemed nice, so I said yes. A decision that would haunt me for the next two years. David and I had a lot of fun at homecoming, so when he asked me to be his girlfriend, I said yes. It's important to note that he was quite the loner. He was very much into science, and often spent time alone conducting experiments in his room and even at school sometimes. I just brushed it off as him being quirky, and I figured I shouldn't get in the way of his passions, but it wasn't long before I realized there was much more to his nice guy facade. Over the next several weeks of our relationship, we would talk over the phone, and David would make increasingly inappropriate comments about things he wanted to do to me. I was 15 at the time, and he was 17, so not only was I incredibly uncomfortable, but he was also nearly an adult himself making these comments to a younger girl. I kept telling him that I wasn't comfortable with the things he was saying, but he always just laughed it off as me being a prude. I was fed up after a while, and then finally I threatened to break up with him, and that finally made him stop. I really should have recognized the red flags and bailed at that very moment, but again, I was dumb and I felt like I wasn't worth anything unless I had a boyfriend. Although the inappropriate comments stopped for the time being, he would still become increasingly possessive and downright obsessed over what I was doing at all hours of the day. He would intrude on conversations that I had with my friends and want to know things that frankly weren't any of his business. One day when I was getting into the shower, he had called, and my dad had told him I would call him when I was done. Well, instead of simply waiting like any rational person would do, he called a total of four times over the next 10 to 15 minutes to see if I was out of the shower yet. I began to feel suffocated, but every time I asked him to back off, he would cry about how depressed he was, and that he only wanted to talk to someone to feel like he was wanted. I always fell for it like the dummy I was but now I recognized the clear manipulation that it was. One day though, I had finally had enough. I broke up with him in person at school, and he bawled like a child. I didn't let it get to me this time, however, and firmly told him that I didn't want to be his girlfriend anymore. Although he couldn't get his way, he still somehow convinced me to stay friends with him. But things didn't end there. This is just the beginning. Over the next several months, David kept trying to get me to go back out with him again, even going as far as to cry in front of other people to garner sympathy. He even tried starting rumors about us having sex, which we didn't. Fortunately for me, David had earned a bad reputation throughout his school career, so no one really believed him. He would even try to trick me into a date by subtly suggesting we go see a movie just as friends which I always got around by inviting my friends to come along too. They knew what he was doing and never turned down the chance to help out a girl. And the last few weeks I spoke to him, he would sit on the phone for hours on end, literally begging me to take him back. And thankfully, I had held on strong and kept refusing. One night, his brother actually called me, telling me that he was crying hysterically. 
Eventually, it came to a point where I told him that I didn't want to hang out anymore because it was clear that he wouldn't stop until I eventually became his girlfriend again. He finally agreed to not approach me anymore, but I wouldn't be writing this story if it ended here. The very next day at school, David came up to me like nothing had happened. I once again reminded him of the conversation that we had had the night before about how we agreed not to hang out anymore, but he had acted offended that I would even suggest such a thing. Eventually, my friends and I convinced him to leave, but of course, it didn't stop there. For two weeks straight, he would follow me around school and call my house and my cell phone. This was the days before smartphones, so blocking his number wasn't that easy. I tried to get help from the school staff, but the vice principal personally told me that there was nothing I could do because he wasn't trying to hurt me. I was frustrated. But thankfully, David seemed to back off when it was clear that I wasn't going to give in. That is, until I got another boyfriend. The following school year, my junior year, I had started dating a senior named Justin. Not long after we went public with our relationship, I had noticed David following me again. Now, Justin was a football player, and he was a pretty big guy with unresolved anger issues, so he didn't take kindly to this guy. He would hang out with me and my friends, and David would hover around nearby, walking by every now and then and making it blatantly obvious that he was spying on me. Well, one day Justin walked straight up to David and confronted him. He didn't lay his hands on him or threaten him in any way, but he did ask, Hey man, what are you doing? In a really angry tone. David simply muttered some kind of excuse and just scurried away. We thought that was the end of it. But later in the day, I was then called to the principal's office. Turns out, David claimed that Justin threatened him and then blocked the doorway so he couldn't move. Justin denied it, of course, and then told the principal that I could back up his claim, which I did. Thankfully, nothing came of it. But this was only the first of a long line of incidents. Over the school year, David and his brother, who was a year younger than me, would try to get Justin in trouble in every way that they could even starting rumors and threatening his life. A classmate of mine overheard them talking about ambushing Justin and hurting him, but even though I brought this up to the staff, nothing was ever done about it. All the while, David kept following me when Justin wasn't around. There was even an incident in the school gym one day when a bunch of classes had to stay there for the period. He and I were both there, and he made sure to sit on the bleachers nearby, even following me when I moved. I was on the verge of tears, but then I saw two guys that I knew sitting a few rows down from me. They were really cool with me, so I got their attention, and after explaining what was going on, I asked them if I could sit with them to feel safer. They accepted, and we ended up having a good old time talking about music and anime. In spite of this, though, things just kept getting worse with David. It finally came to a head when David's brother had wrote a letter to Justin's sister. They had been good friends before this whole mess started, and in the letter, David's brother actually threatened physical harm to both me and Justin. The sister gave the letter to Justin, who then came to me, and then we both brought it to the principal. That was when the principal called everyone involved into his office and had a nice little chat with us. The principal showed the letter to David's brother, then said, I can expel you for this right now, but I'm willing to let it go on one condition. Now you see, David and Justin were both about to graduate, so the principal gave them the ultimatum. He stated that David and his brother were to not contact me or Justin in any way, shape, or form for the whole rest of the school year, or he would see it that neither one of them would graduate. I was absolutely pissed because Justin did nothing wrong, but in the end, we just wanted this whole mess to be over with. From that point on, David didn't bother me again, but I'm still filled with anxiety to this day. He made me afraid for my life or to even walk the halls of my school. Justin and I ended up breaking up during the summer for unrelated reasons, and the following year, I didn't have to see either of them ever again. A few years later, however, David tried to send me a friend request on Facebook. Of course. I had an immediate panic attack and not only deleted the request, but I blocked him as well. I even unfriended and blocked the two mutual friends we had just for good measure. Sure, I was being paranoid, 
but it made me feel better. There was one last incident involving David, not with me, but with my younger brother. When he was 14, he had took his then-girlfriend to see one of the Transformers movies, and David walked in. Upon recognizing my brother, he sat right behind him and his date, and kept laughing uncontrollably at inappropriate times, and even started kicking their seats. My brother tried confronting him, but it did no good. They didn't even bother trying to get the manager, because my brother's date was way too afraid that he would attack them if they tried to leave. Thankfully, that was the final incident that I or anyone else close to me ever had with them. I'm doing much better now. I'm 31 years old, and ironically, I ended up mirroring one of the guys who sat with me in the gym that day. My advice to any teenagers hearing this is that you should always pay attention to red flags and absolutely get rid of toxic people that are in your life. Trust me, it's always better to end up alone than being stuck with someone who makes you feel bad and treats you like your feelings don't matter. Hey everyone, hope you guys enjoyed these stories. If you have your own story, you should definitely consider sending it to me at southerncannibal.com. Also, I have some merch out, so maybe consider getting a shirt or something. And in case you didn't know, I also post every episode on my podcast as well on Spotify. Link in the description if you want to check that out. Have a good weekend, everyone. And remember, to always...